So <coughs> here's a, a lesson on radioactivity, and I'm going to cover all of radioactivity from start to finish. Um, I'm probably going to place this into two uh, videos, so this is the first of the two. Okay, let's start with stuff that you should have done in chemistry already, and that's the idea of the, this um, scientific notation. Let me just take a, um, an element, let's go lithium, and I'll just run through what each of these symbols mean. <coughs> First of all, the top number here, that means the numbers of protons and neutrons. The bottom number needs the number of protons, and this, of course, represents the element. Now, if the bottom number changes, the number of proton numbers changes, then the element itself must change. You'll never get two of the same elements. Um, with, you'll never get different elements with the same number of protons. However, you will get the same element with a different number at the top here, or as we call this, the atomic mass. And that's because you can get a change in the number of neutrons. So let's just imagine we could get something like this, I'm guessing. And therefore, let's just go through what each of these have um, independently. So first of all, they both have three protons. That's a must, and that's the first thing you should understand. Um, the 7 here represents the number of protons and neutrons, so therefore you have 7 lots of protons and neutrons minus the number of protons gives you 4 neutrons. Here, however, you have 8 protons and neutrons minus the 3 that you've got gives you 5 neutrons. And <clears throat> finally, if these are neutral elements, then you know that they should have 3 electrons to cancel out the number of protons, and they should have 3 electrons to cancel out the proton charge. Um, these two, of course, are called isotopes of the same element. So isotopes mean the same number of protons, but differing neutrons. Okay, so first of all, um, I hope you're happy with that scientific notation, and also um, what the difference between isotopes are, because they're very important in understanding the next idea. <clears throat> and the next point is that an atom, if I draw it in its very basic way, let's draw lithium, let's keep the lithium example, would be three of these protons and then three neutrons. And that is the nucleus of the atom. <clears throat> then around the outside of that, you get a series of, I suppose, electrons in their numerous shells, but that's more of a conversation for chemistry. However, for us, this, or the nucleus, nucleus, is where nuclear physics is concerned with. And so therefore, we need to look much more carefully at how that nucleus is set up and built up. And I suppose the way that we ought to do this is maybe go historically first and explain what happened and why they believe that you have this model as opposed to, which is also known as the Rutherford model. As opposed to what was previously known as the plum pudding model. And that model was very simply just a great big atom. So where the boundary of the atom is, the atom is. <coughs> and it said all of this is a positive dough, a dough referring to the plum pudding. And then what you have is you have these very randomly displaced um, electrons throughout, just like you would in a plum pudding with raisins being, or plums being the, um, the electrons. Okay, so what you need to do is you need to have a very thorough knowledge of why the Rutherford model is the Rutherford model. So let's take a look at the experiment that happened. Essentially, these new things came about which were called alpha particles. <coughs> and they're given the represent representation as that. Um, just to be absolutely sure, um, we know what they are. Let's just write in their atomic, their, their notation like the one above. It's 4, 2, and then we put those in square brackets because it's 2 plus. 
And what that means is that this alpha particle has two protons, four protons and neutrons, that must mean it's got two neutrons, and it's got two positive charges. In other words, there are no electrons on it. So if I wanted to draw that, I'd draw it like this. Proton, proton, neutron, neutron. Or you can call it a helium nucleus. OK, so just draw that to one side. Now, these alpha particles were fired into uh, thin pieces of gold leaf. And what they were expecting to happen is they were expecting this to have a nice, um, even spread of deviation. Because inside this gold leaf, the alpha particle would interact with things. By the way, that interaction, um, they were expecting to be electrostatic. And when I mean electrostatic, I mean because of the like charges repel, opposite charges attract. They're expecting things to be going on in here, according to the plum pudding model. Um, but what they actually got was they got the majority of these things went straight through the alpha particles, that, that is. And then on the rare occasion, you did get this huge deviation, but the majority went straight through, and very few sort of made small little deviations. Most went all the way straight, straight through. So when you have to describe this, you have to say, well, why is that? And essentially, the reason is, is because though these atoms, and I'm drawing this as a gross uh, oddity in scale, though these atoms uh, were present, they were held shoulder, uh, I suppose, electron cloud to electron cloud. And really, the nucleus, which is a bit in the middle, was separated by an amazing distance, comparatively. So most of the alpha particles went straight through the gap. And on the rare occasion that it did make a head-on collision, and when I mean head-on, it, it went very, very close to the nucleus, it got deviated by a huge amount. So first of all, the first idea, let me just write, let me just uh, keep that page there so we can write down the findings of this. And this is how you'll have to describe it. There are some findings. Let's do the first one. Okay, then. Most went straight through. Okay. Um, why was that? Because there's because atoms have a lot of empty space. Okay, then. The second one, large deviations. And the reason behind that is because most of the mass of the atom is in a very small nucleus. Okay, I suppose you could write this here as well. This is a very small nucleus. Okay, and I suppose as well, that the other point that you need to make is you need to say to yourself that um, the positive helium nucleus repels away from the positive gold nucleus. You need to understand that it's a positive, positive interaction that causes these deviations to take place. Okay, good. So uh, we've looked at how you, um, we looked at the notation, we looked at the Rutherford model and the reasons why there is the Rutherford model. So now let's go back to the notation and say, well, what on earth is this radioactive um, thing we're talking about? <clears throat> well, let's go back to our um, our notation, and I'll briefly uh, talk to you about why it is that some things are radioactive or not. And this is a very um, 
a sort of brief hand-waving reason as to why they are. Okay, now, you will get um, all of the elements that you know on the periodic table. The majority of them are stable. And the reason why they're stable is because you have this, this balance between the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Let me draw another example of this. So this is a stable lithium um, atom, and that's how it occurs in nature. Let's try and draw another lithium atom that wouldn't be stable. And let's just imagine we had three protons and one neutron. Okay, now, um, you can see here that the protons, which are positive, are going to experience a force that's going to be pushing them out from each other. There is another force as well called the strong nuclear force, which holds these together, which binds them all together. But to aid that force, you want to separate the protons out as far as possible. This one, of course, has them very close, so they're going to experience large forces, so this is likely to be unstable. This one is stable. So some isotopes, and in this case, if I needed to draw and explain which one this is, this is the lithium four, because there are four particles, is unstable. And if a particle is unstable, then it is likely to fire out radiation. And it can fire out radiation in three ways. So unstable equals radioactive. And the reason why is because it will rearrange the particles in its nucleus to try and find a more stable position. And this is likely to occur, you know, more than just one <coughs> decay. It's likely to decay and continue to decay until it becomes more stable. So it can, do, it can either spit out radioactively here an alpha, a beta, or gamma. And those are the three types. Uh, let's write them in. Alpha beta and gamma. And let's, uh, let's uh, say what they are. Alpha, which we've talked about as a helium nucleus, um, and we draw that as a 4, 2, 2 plus. Beta is a fast moving electron. Or we could also say a high kinetic energy. And so therefore it's being an electron, it's going to have minus one as its atomic number. And it has no mass because we say it's massless, effectively the electron weight is. And gamma is an electromagnetic wave of high energy. Um, massless, no proton, but it has a high energy. Now, if these um, if these three bits of radiation are spat out from a nucleus, then you're going to get a change in the, what what's left. So you need to be aware of how these change, and to be able to complete these types of equations. So let's just let's just bring in an unstable um, nucleus, and let's see what happens to it. Let's say we've got carbon fourteen. Okay, we call it carbon-14 because that's the weight the weight of it. Carbon has six protons, so therefore we must have eight neutrons going on here, and it's just an unstable atom. It's used for carbon, uh, using um, carbon dating. Okay, and let's imagine that that spits out a beta particle. What's it left with? So, I mean, really from that instance you can work out the rest because you should understand that Beta is minus 1, 0. And then what happens is, imagine that arrow like an equal sign. So along the top, you must have something 14 here. And you must have something 7 along the bottom. And if you looked up in a periodic table, I just know that 7 is nitrogen. So you move from carbon into nitrogen. Now, this is a really interesting one. And this is one that we need to really comment on a little bit more before going on. If this is a nuclear process where I've only got protons and neutrons, how on earth do I get a, an electron being fired out when the electrons are floating around in the electron cloud on the outside? <laughs> and really what takes place is that if we looked carefully inside our nucleus, uh, do I have to, yeah, I probably have to draw carbon for you here, so one, two, three, four, five, six, 
plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8. All right, that is my... Uh, no, let's draw it here again. Okay, so that's, I'm just doing exactly the same. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right, there is my carbon-14 nucleus. Now in moving forward, what have I got left over? Now I've got the same number of particles, but I've got 7 rather than 6. So let's colour one of those in there. And that is my nitrogen. So what's taken place as I've moved across from there to there is the proton has changed into a neutron and an electron. The electron has become the beta particle and the neutron has been retained inside. Sorry, let's do that again. I've taken a neutron which has turned into a proton. So one of my neutrons, which is white, has turned into a proton, and the electron they've given off has turned into a beta particle. That's the trickiest one to deal with, and the one that you'll have to explain the most. So this, in effect, is a beta decay. Okay, let's try an alpha decay quickly. Let's try uranium 23592. This one is um quite famous because uranium um, undergoes fission, but if it's not dividing and splitting, well, it's fission, which we'll explain later, then it undergoes an alpha decay. So, once again, you know that alpha is 4,2 um, alpha, so what's left, and this one is much easier because it's a nuclear process which is just taking out two protons and two neutrons, because remember that implies two protons and two neutrons, and it leaves us with 2, 3, 1, and 90. I know that 90 is thorium. It's a straightforward process. And interestingly, what happens with the gamma decay is that all you do is inside the... Because I've got no change of protons and neutrons, what happens is I just get a rearrangement. These will move around a bit, and as they move around and reposition themselves, the energy change fires out an electromagnetic wave. So no change happens at all to this. Superb. Um, right, I suppose I ought to really talk about, finally, um, a little bit of half-life. So let's move on to the idea of um, our atom. Let's now, I'm just going to draw a big atom here. And let's say that it is radioactive. I could have, no, okay, it, let's imagine it's radioactive. That means not a, it's spitting out radiation. Okay, and if I have a small atom, or, or a smaller quantity of the same atom, it too will be spitting out radiation, but to a lesser amount. Okay. Now, when we're talking about how much radiation is being given out, we're talking about the activity. And activity means the number of decays <coughs> per second. So if I talk about that activity, the number of decays per second is given a very specific word. It's called becquerels. So five becquerels is five decays per second. Um, 10 decays per second would be 10 becquerels, etc., etc. And the unit is per second. Interesting, because you've got number of decays, which is an arbitrary number, per second. Now, the important thing here is that <coughs> if you have a very large atom, you've got a large amount of decay. If you've got a smaller atom, you've got a smaller amount, and smaller and smaller, etc., etc. So what happens is this is undergoing... We call it an exponential function, but that you don't need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of the shape that it, that it creates. So if I had the time axis in seconds, and I had activity in becquerels, then what's going to happen is this is going to adopt the shape like this. It's an exponential curve. 
Now, that, uh, those number decays per second. I mean, it could also, you get the same shape if you're looking at the number of atoms remaining. So either, it doesn't matter which units they are, you can either have activity or the number of atoms remaining. Because, of course, over time, you'll get fewer of these, or the, inter the interim position. So either of them behaves like that. And what they're likely to do is they're likely to ask you about the half-life of this decaying um, element. And what you would do there is this exponential function is very unique in that whichever point you take, you look at the time, and then if you take half of that value, you look at the time again, this is what's known as the half-life. I, the time it's taken for the activity or the number of atoms to halve. Now what you should find is if you find the half of this value here, you should find the same value. Because that's the nature of this type of function. It's exponentially, it will have the same half-life. So you will need to read off values and work out what the half-life is. And interesting, and what I think is quite important here as well, is that if you were to... Um, uh, try and work out the half-life, you've got the one major consideration is don't just take one value, you need to find three values and then take the average. So if possible, if you can do that, take three values of the half-life, then find the average. And the reason why you take the average is because this is a random process. If there's one word you want to write down at any stage in the answers, it's a random process. So you will get different answers all the time, and only, through, and only when you work out the averages you get something very predictable. Okay, you might get some question that asks you something that is not necessarily a graph, but values. Let's imagine I started with 10,000. Um, atoms, and then um, it wants, and it says I've got a half life of two years. How long? Four. I have two thousand five hundred atoms. Let's say. And this often catches people out because it's a compound half, a half, 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 half. It's not a quarter as you think here. Let me show you. In order we go from a thousand, right, one half life will give me five thousand. Another half life will give me two thousand five hundred. So therefore the answer is two lots of half-lives, which is four years. So be careful about that point. Okay, so you look at it graphically. Uh, you might look at it as a calculation at best. And I suppose as well, if you were commenting on half-life and working out the half-life, this may be presented to you as a series of data points that you have to then write down. Be aware, along with this idea that this is a random process, that there is a background radiation that is always present. So if you're taking readings, you'd have to make a background correction. So for instance, if you had a table of results, each value you'd had, you need to take a background count off it. And the way you do the background is you just let it run. You let a detector run for a while and work out what its activity is. Uh, you could talk endlessly about the sources of background radiation, but the major one are cosmic rays and rocks from the ground. Uh, you can say the weapons industry and medicine, but they're small fractions compared to those two. But any will be given, um, given credit. Okay, in the next video we'll look at um, more on detection, penetration 
of the radiation and the, the damage that it might do in its detection.